Mr. Pablo de Greif, Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, members of the Board of Management of the Lakshman Kadurgam Institute, uh, Commanders, Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Prasad Kariwasan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to the Lakshman Kadurgam Institute. Uh, before we begin the proceedings this afternoon, if I could request you to turn your mobile phones on to silent. We are here for a lecture on an important topic by a global expert in the field. Mr. Pablo de Grief is the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence, and will offer his views on the topic of transitional justice. Mr. de Grief, who hails from Colombia, was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2012 as its first special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. He previously served as the director of research at the International Center of, for Transitional Justice from 2001 to 2014. And in addition, he was also an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the State University of New York. Among his more recent appointments, in 2015, he was named Senior Fellow and Director of the Transitional Justice Project at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at the School of Law at New York University. Mr. de Greff, it's truly an honor for us to have you uh, speak on a matter of critical importance to Sri Lanka and its future. And the, pro the program today is quite simple. Mr. de Graeff will speak for approximately 20 minutes and will then open it up to questions and answers uh, for the remainder of the hour. It's with great pleasure that I now hand the floor over to Mr. de Graeff. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great honor uh, for me to be here. So uh, let me start uh, by thanking uh, the minister, the secretariat, but particularly the institute for uh, organizing uh, the talk. I also, of course, want to thank uh, all of you for uh, your interest uh, in uh, listening to what um, I have to say. Uh, I would like to uh, keep the comments uh, brief uh, in order to have the opportunity to have uh, a conversation. Uh, and uh, perhaps divide uh, my brief intervention into two main sections. One about uh, uh, the, um, a short history of the development of the concept of transitional justice and a second uh, brief part on uh, the future of uh, the notion uh, as I see it. Uh, I think that in the field, there's a lot to celebrate in the field of transitional justice. It managed in a relatively short period of time to consolidate itself, to become a field. This is indeed uh, a field. Uh, there are lots of activities around it. It is discussed in many, in many different places, including, of course, Sri Lanka, Colombia, the country where I come from, uh, and many, many other countries. It is, in fact, uh, uh, not just a, a field that has consolidated, uh, that there are ministries of foreign affairs that devote attention to it, international cooperation agencies that invest uh, in transitional justice, Academically, we know that there are people writing masters and PhD theses on it. There's a specialized uh, journal. For those of you who are interested in the sociology of knowledge as I am, a big marker of a uh, consolidating field is the appearance of a specialized encyclopedia. And since 2012, Cambridge University published uh, the Encyclopedia of uh, Transitional Justice, which uh, sociologically is interesting because, of course, it is a way not just of uh, uh, reporting the state uh, of discussions at any given point of time, but also establishing borders between itself and other adjoining, uh, adjoining areas. 
of uh, academic research. So there's no question that, that this happened, and it happened in a fairly short period of time. Much more importantly than this, however, is that the field managed in a space of 20 to 30 years to normalize itself, and by that I mean that it has become part of the presumptive set of measures that countries are expected to implement after they undergo a transition. And anything that anyone who is familiar with how difficult it is to achieve normative change at the international level would, of course, understand the magnitude of this accomplishment. In a 20 to 30 year period, it became the norm in, at the international level that when you are, for example, emerging from a period of dictatorship, but also right now when you are emerging from a period of conflict, you will apply measures relating to truth, to justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. And the fact that this happened in such a short period of time, I find it to be a remarkable accomplishment. Now, there is a second dimension to the consolidation of the field, and not just that there is so much activity around it, but the particular way in which the field took shape is also worth remarking upon. Now, we are completely used to thinking that these four different sets of measures complement one another that it is important to establish not just one of them, but all of them. That in the field, truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence are not like items in a menu from which people can pick and choose, but rather that they are supposed to be part of a comprehensive uh, policy. No one could have taken this for granted uh, 25 years ago. The origins of the field were marked by hugely acrimonious debates between what at the time people thought were defenders of truth versus what at the time people described themselves as defenders of justice. Since 2004, in, uh, in the report that the then Secretary General of the United Nations published on transitional justice and the rule of law, the idea is that these four elements are not uh, a random collection of initiatives, but that they are part of a holistic, comprehensive policy. And this is asserted in the report uh, in no uncertain terms. This idea that transitional justice is a holistic policy is one of the things that I would like to emphasize today. I must have the longest, I must say ridiculously long title of anyone in the United Nations system. Now, so the short version of it is that I'm the special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence which is a, a horrible mouthful, creates all sorts of difficulties when people ask me to sign uh, guest books because it takes about 12 minutes to write uh, the title alone. But it has the advantage that it is descriptive of a certain understanding of transitional justice. And the fact that these four elements are, as it were, housed in the same special procedure is a reflection of the fact that they are meant to be understood as complementary measures, not as antagonistic measures, not as mutually exclusive alternatives, but rather as parts of a whole. And I would like to devote a few minutes to an explanation of why I think that this is important. Because of course, in virtually every case, there is in fact the temptation to think 
that these are options amongst which choices can be made, and furthermore, that these are items amongst which trade-off relations can be established. So in many, many different countries, for example, the temptation on the part of governments is to say, we are going to be somewhat expansive and active in the domain of truth. We will try to be generous in the domain of uh, reparations so that we do not have to do any prosecutions. This is a very, very widespread uh, attitude towards uh, transitional justice. But it is one that doesn't work. And part of what I would like to say constitutes an explanation of why that doesn't work. There are, in my mind, two different sorts of arguments to explain why it is important to think about transitional justice holistically. The first one is a pragmatic uh, argument. And it is a pragmatic argument that I would like to say starts from a recognition of the limitations of each of the measures, about which I think that the field ought to be much more modest than it has been up to this point. So I think that it is important to uh, acknowledge something that can be observed. There is no country that can legitimately claim that it has investigated each and every violation of human rights in its past. There is no country that can claim that it has prosecuted each and every violator, and there is no country that can claim that has, it has punished each and every violator in proportion to the harm that that person caused. There is no country that has established a truth-seeking mechanism that has clarified the fate of each and every victim. There is no country that has established a trans, uh, truth commission that has clarified the role of each and every institution that allowed or enabled the commission of violations. There is no country, unfortunately, that has repaired each and every victim in proportion to the uh, harm that they suffered and none has managed to reform each and every institution that participated in human rights violations in the short term. I think that we ought to acknowledge this. The expectation that this can happen and that it can happen in the short run has not been realized anywhere. Now, having said this, however, of course, I am not uh, a romantic uh, thinking that the transitional justice is an instrument for turning uh, difficult situations into paradise instantaneously, but neither am I a cynic. I am totally convinced about the potential of transitional justice measures to achieve significant transformations. Now, but the main point I want to concentrate in is the following. Because the measures individually are limited and they do not have the reach that we would like them to have. When implemented in a way that uh, uh, complement one another, they have the potential to strengthen their overall impact. And by now, we have empirical evidence that this is indeed the case. That when measures are implemented in total isolation from one another, as if they had nothing to do with one another, they produce results that are much less sustainable, that from the standpoint of the victims are much less satisfactory, that from the standpoint of the impact on their on uh, institutional reform, they are significantly weaker than when they are part of a comprehensive plan that people understand constitutes an honest effort to redress violations that took place in the past. So that's a pragmatic argument having to do with an observation of what the measures, each of them on their own, can accomplish. 
The second argument is a more conceptual argument. I think that it is important for us to go back to a fundamental question about what is it that we are trying to accomplish in doing transitional justice? What is our ultimate aim? By now, a certain model has developed. Transitional justice consists in the implementation of a truth commission, a reparations program, the development of a prosecutorial strategy, and some elements of institutional reform. But I have been to countries where I have asked uh, the relevant ministries, and why are you establishing a truth commission? And the answer is, mm, well, isn't this what we are supposed to do? <laughs> and I think that there is uh, something problematic about this. What we are supposed to do is to resolve uh, certain fundamental problems having to do with the weakness of uh, a rights-respecting regime. And these measures were supposed uh, to be an instrument for doing this. They were designed with the idea that when collectively implemented, one of the results that they have is to strengthen the conception of rights in a certain uh, country. But the, before we get there, I think the argument is the following. It makes sense from my standpoint to think that the different measures, truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence share certain aims. One of the aims that arguably they share is that they provide recognition to victims. In many situations in which uh, there have been systematic uh, human rights violations, large-scale violations, either as the result of authoritarianism or of conflict, there is a whole set of the population that can be described in many different ways depending on the context that feels that their rights have never been acknowledged. And part of the reason why we do this, why we create these institutions, is precisely to provide some recognition, not just to the victims as victims, but to the victims primarily as rights holders. This is part of the point of doing transitional justice. The second aim that arguably the four measures share is that as a consequence, they help to strengthen the rule of law. Uh, they are meant to send signals to the population that the violation of rights is not inconsequential, that the institutions of the state are willing to provide clarity about how the violations uh, took place that they are willing to establish reliable, transparent systems in order to decide the questions about uh, criminal responsibility, that they are willing to establish programs of reparations that try to mitigate some of the consequences of the rights violations, and that they are seriously committed to the idea that those violations should not be repeated, and therefore they establish appropriate mechanisms of uh, institutional reform. Through all these means, uh, the end result is supposed to be a strengthening of the rule of law. I would like to concentrate on two additional shared aims that arguably uh, can be attributed to the measures. Truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence have the potential of uh, strengthening or fostering civic trust. In situations in which uh, uh, countries are emerging from authoritarianism or for conflict, it is, of course, not surprising that one of the end results are very, very low levels of trust. Very low levels of trust between individuals, very low levels of trust between communities, and uh, particularly importantly, very low levels of trust in the institutions of the state. Transitional justice 
is supposed to foster civic trust. It cannot do it on its own, of course. Uh, transitional justice is not like a magic potion, but it is one of the ways in which governments around different parts of the world have found that they can signal the trustworthiness of their efforts and the institutions. And when implemented well, this is indeed what has happened. And finally, and as a consequence of achieving those three sets of goals, providing recognition to victims, strengthening the rule of law, uh, fostering uh, civic trust, uh, transitional justice has the potential of fostering a certain type of social integration or what can be called, uh, using the more common term, a certain type of uh, reconciliation. So reconciliation from this standpoint is something that comes about partially from the successful implementation of these measures for which uh, it is supposed to be instrumental. Now, the argument, and I will finish the first part of my intervention here. The second one, don't worry, will be shorter. The <laughs> argument is uh, the following. Just uh, as the four measures are not a random collection of initiatives, but are unified in part by the fact that they share the same objectives, those four objectives, providing a recognition to victims, strengthening the rule of law, fostering a, a trust, and uh, achieving a minimal sense of social integration are related to one another. What unites them is that all of them refer to the respect of, right, of norms, of certain norms. Uh, strengthening the rule of law is, of course, a normatively guided activity. Providing recognition to victims is not simply providing recognition for the suffering that they endured, but providing recognition for them in their status as rights holders, which is, of course, again, a normative uh, notion. Even fostering trust, trust is not the same thing as uh, empirical reliability. A trust is, uh, rests upon the conviction that the other takes certain considerations to be important. I, of course, can predict that corrupt regimes will try to extort me. But the predictability doesn't mean that I trust those regimes. I trust a regime only when I am convinced that those who operate the institutions of the regime guide their behavior by norms that I share. So the point is that trust is itself a normative notion. So at the heart of the transitional justice project is the strengthening of the place of certain fundamental norms in the decision-making process, both of institutions and of individuals. And those norms, as it happens, are human rights norms. So transitional justice, from my perspective, is inextricably linked uh, with the notion of human rights. Now, the fact that it is, is also significant because it distinguishes the Transitional Justice Project from any partisan political project. Transitional justice is defeated when it becomes a partisan political issue. Transitional justice is not an instrument of turn-taking. It's not the instrument by which the regime in power says it is now our turn to benefit our supporters and try to harm our opponents. This is, after all, a question of fundamental rights, and that means the rights of all. Uh, this is a justice project. It is not a partisan uh, political project. 
It is also important because uh, it distinguishes transitional justice from anything that resembles a witch hunt, a massive purge, an effort to advance the interests of some over the interests of others. Ultimately, I think that this is a policy that through the implementation of the four sets of measures, rather than the selective implementation of some and the abandonment of others, it offers the potential of bringing communities together around the principles that can be considered to be shared, that protects the rights of victims, but also of uh, uh, those that have been alleged uh, to commit perpetrators, and that precisely th through strengthening the reliability of methods by which to adjudicate uh, social conflicts has the potential of also strengthening a, a sustainable peace. So I think uh, I will uh, end here so that we can have uh, a conversation. Uh, once again, I am delighted to be here. It is an honor to give a talk uh, at the house of someone who was himself a very, very strong defender of uh, human rights. And I am very happy to be able to make a case for the relevance of uh, transitional justice as a rights-enhancing set of measures. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, secondly, you discuss the complementarity of the four different aspects of, of transitional justice, the fact that it has moved beyond uh, a situation where people could pick and choose between the four concepts, uh, or the four aspects rather, uh, but they work together as a whole, and that's how it's understood now. Um, you did, uh, I think, talk valuably about the aspirational, the third being the aspirational nature of uh, transitional justice, that it would um, be overly optimistic to assume or expect any country to reach these aspects in absolute terms, uh, that they're seen um, as, uh, as, as things that we should, as countries aspire to, but that no country has been able to implement uh, completely and fully, uh, and perhaps uh, no country can do that. Uh, fourthly, you valuably explain the importance of intent over form uh, in transitional justice. Uh, you use very words like willing, serious, um, which I, I thought was uh, very helpful in, um, in sort of countering the perception sometimes of, a, of an institutional emphasis in, in transitional justice. Uh, and, and, and fifthly, uh, you, you brought in the phrase of, um, of civic trust, looking at the aim of transitional justice uh, as forming that, that, that civic trust amongst uh, communities, uh, something that, that, that flowed from uh, that, that fourth uh, aspect of, of, of intent over form. So with, with, with just those few points highlighted, I'm sure the audience took away many other points, and I see in the audience very distinguished scholars, activists, policymakers, uh, with, uh, who are respected uh, and highly knowledgeable in the field of transitional justice. Um, so I look forward to their questions. Uh, if I could take the liberty of perhaps starting with one, um, uh, and, and that is on uh, to picking up on the normalization aspect that you began with. Uh, whether normalization brought with it uh, and uh, whether the normalization was almost too rapid, uh, and perhaps uh, we talk about sort of scaling too quickly in, in terms of in uh, building up of institutions, and, and perhaps the same thing happens to concepts. Um, with that, did the concept of transitional justice become internationalized? Um, so uh, did it grow from a, a rooted, a grass-rooted concept to um, an international concept where the conversations were happening more at an, at an international level uh, and 
uh, the stakeholders were seen as being more international and external and less about uh, the domestic. So, uh, shall we start? Yeah, I think you could so start with first, that. I want to thank you for the very, very nice summary of the talk. Make it much more clearer than uh, what I said myself. So, thank you very much uh, for for bringing up uh, those very, very orderly uh, points. On your question, I mean, I think there are two dimensions uh, to it. We are living in an increase in an increasingly integrated uh, world in which uh, there is the vi very rapid uh, transmission of knowledge and experience from one case uh, to another. And uh, first, uh, this is inevitable. Second, uh, there are many extraordinarily positive dimensions uh, to that. So the learning curve uh, in all transitional justice uh, processes has been accelerating, as you would expect, from the increasing accessibility of information. So the roots of the field, the first few countries that attempted to do what we now call transitional justice, for example, Argentina and Chile, if you take the fact that they are neighboring countries, but this was, of course, pre-internet days, the learning process between uh, those two countries, despite uh, their geographical proximity, was arguably less than the learning process that now takes place between countries that are very, very distant from one another geographically, but where information flows from one to the other completely unimpeded. Uh, the South African process, for example, which lies in a sort of midpoint uh, in this developmental arch that one can talk about. Uh, there were conferences organized uh, prior to the drafting of the South African constitution containing uh, the, some of the transitional justice uh, provisions and uh, before the drafting of the act uh, that established uh, the Truth Commission. And those were uh, meetings in which uh, Latin American uh, experts uh, took a part. But the transmission of knowledge at the time uh, still required uh, traveling. Now, that doesn't happen. Now, I think that there is uh, a lot to be said uh, for the quick uh, accessibility. There is, of course, a danger in the process of uh, normalization that we are talking about. And that is that uh, uh, policies become uh, uh, templates, you know? that a paradigm that takes shape in a particular context is automatically and rapidly uh, transferred to a context that may look very, very differently in many relevant uh, respects. So there is a downside to the quick accessibility of knowledge and information. On the whole, of course, I am absolutely convinced that the steepness of the learning process, which by the way is of course something that one can observe in Sri Lanka. This is my fifth visit to the country in a two-year period, the conversations that I've been having during the last 10 days, both with civil society and with government, are significantly different than the conversations that I had only two years ago. And part of the difference is uh, that uh, Sri Lankans uh, have become uh, very, very good uh, at uh, transitional justice, knowledgeable, well-informed, uh, perfectly aware of uh, previous examples. And I think that this can only be to the good uh, of the process uh, here. There, there is, however, a second uh, dimension to this uh, that has to do with uh, the normalization at the international level. You know, and uh, the fact that this uh, is now established uh, as a set of norms, uh, both hard law and soft law norms. No? So there are international conventions that establish rights to truth, to justice, 
to reparations, uh, to guarantees of non-recurrence, and the soft law instruments at the international level, like for example, the establishment by the Human Rights Council of the mandate uh, that I now hold. And again, I think that there's something tremendously positive uh, about that. However, ultimately, the success and the sustainability of a transitional justice uh, project doesn't depend on anyone's desire to satisfy the international community. The success and the sustainability of a transitional justice project depends also, and I want to say primarily, on the conviction of people that defend it, that uh, define it, design it, and implement it. And that happens when two factors converge. A very active, robust uh, civil society manages to articulate uh, its demands and uh, minimum expectations, meeting a government that is similarly committed to doing well for its citizens uh, and that can meet uh, at this uh, shared uh, space. And uh, that means that the international instruments are important, that there are, again, both uh, hard and soft uh, instruments that may be of help, but ultimately this is something for which a, a proactive stance, both on the part of civil society and of governments, is a sine qua non. Thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful uh, response. Well, we have some time for questions, um, and we have um, people on either ends who can bring a microphone to you. So if you have a question, please do raise your hand. We'll take uh, uh, perhaps three at a time uh, and see how we go from there. If I can ask you to state your name and keep your questions brief, please. Thank you very much for a very um, enlightening presentation. My name is Ganesh Vigneraja. I'm with the Lakshman Kadirgama Institute. I have two questions for you. The first is, what do you observe about the relationship between transitional justice outcomes and institutional capacity across post-conflict countries? Um, second, is there an ideal sequencing of measures of transitional justice in a country like Sri Lanka could pursue. Thank you. Question over. Chandra Jayaratna. What I'd like to know is, uh, you know, rapid transformation, with, with it comes changing equity. Uh, how do you balance equity? The very first, say the most vulnerable get something. Mm -hmm. And then when you have the equity, where, what, where, what happens to equity when the the next tier of not so vulnerable get something more, or it happens the reverse. Some people get something, the money has run out, and there is nothing to be given to the remnants who remain. How do you balance equity in the process? Thank you. Perhaps we'll take those two okay. questions, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, but, but let me take uh, yours uh, first. All these efforts, uh, transitional justice efforts on all its dimensions, uh, uh, truth, uh, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence, obviously take place in a world of finite resources. If there were infinite resources, uh, we would not be having uh, some of these uh, conversations. Although I suspect uh, that um, there would still be a question about uh, the equitable distribution of the infinite resources. but. Leaving that aside, the, the, in the world uh, as we know it, there is of course a question about, uh, particularly in those cases in which uh, the universe of potential beneficiaries for measures that are uh, costly, uh, let's uh, think about, for example, uh, uh, reparations benefits. Uh, uh, that when the universe of potential beneficiaries is very large and the resources are limited, then uh, there are some difficult choices uh, that they have uh, to be made. Uh, 
One option is to guarantee equity across the board, but that means perhaps the excessive dilution of benefits. So everyone gets a very, very small share of the pie. The equity may be symbolically uh, satisfying, but the benefit will make a very, very little difference uh, to the recipients. Another, another choice is to establish different categories, uh, uh, which is what is very often done by reparation programs, different categories of beneficiaries. So for instance, uh, you compensate, uh, all reparation programs have decided to concentrate on a fairly limited uh, catalog of rights uh, violations. So almost all, for example, have provided benefits for the family members of the disappeared. Uh, almost all of them provide uh, benefits uh, for those that have been illegally detained uh, and often uh, tortured. Almost all of them, and increasingly the case, uh, provide some benefits uh, for the victims of uh, gender-based uh, uh, crimes. Uh, so, and the, the list goes on, but it is not an infinite list. So, for example, there is no reparation program uh, that has uh, provided benefits for violations of uh, the freedom of association, which often happens under circumstances of authoritarianism or of conflict. So, some choices are made with respect uh, to the violations that trigger access to reparation benefits, and uh, some of those choices have to do with the fact uh, that resources are limited. Now, at the more extreme uh, situation in which you have uh, a, a, an extraordinarily large universe of victims and you are operating under uh, circumstances of very, very deep uh, scarcity, some programs have uh, prioritized uh, the order in which beneficiaries uh, are served uh, by the reparation programs, starting, for example, with uh, the most vulnerable, uh, elderly widows, uh, people that are handicapped, uh, that cannot uh, take care for themselves. And once those layers of people are uh, uh, served uh, by the reparation programs, the scope uh, starts expanding which in many ways is a way of amortizing the costs of the reparation program over time. But let me make uh, a couple of remarks that I think uh, are relevant. The political economy of reparation programs is much more important uh, than the sheer economy of it. Uh, my experience is that many, many countries have governments that uh, start with the assumption we cannot do reparations because it is too expensive. And I ask government officials, why? Uh, I would like to know something about uh, the costing efforts uh, that you have uh, carried out in order to come to the conclusion uh, that you cannot afford this. And it turns out that they have done none. So, I mean, in a certain sense, that undermines uh, the argument that the problem is that it is too expensive. And uh, what underlies the reluctance is uh, something of an entirely different nature. The second point, which is related to this, is that there is no clear correlation between the magnitude of the benefits that have been distributed by reparation programs and uh, the degree of uh, socioeconomic development of a country beyond uh, a certain threshold. So once a country uh, crosses a certain threshold of economic development, there, there is absolutely no correlation between the magnitude of the benefits, the overall costs of the program, and uh, at the level of wealth uh, of the country, proving again that the political economy of uh, reparations is much more important uh, than the sheer economic uh, factors. So, uh, now, thank you very much uh, for your two questions. There is, of course, uh, a relationship between institutional capacities
and the types uh, of uh, transitional justice measures that a country can afford uh, to establish. So going back uh, to the question of reparations, for example, there is uh, almost universal consensus that uh, the effects of a reparations program are enhanced by distributing the benefits in terms of a pension rather than a one-off uh, uh, cash turnover. The one-off payment has several negative factors counting against it. It invites the thought that this is the price that is paid on the life of a victim, which of course uh, is uh, an impossible uh, thought, uh, a thought that should not be invited. Uh, life doesn't have a price. There is no magnitude of money that can be put uh, on a life that would uh, satisfy the victims. Uh, but beyond that, the positive effects of uh, a regularly paid support, it's not just uh, that it leads uh, to a more sustainable improvement in the quality of life of victims, but that even at the symbolic level, it acts as a constant reminder of the fact that someone has taken the rights violations to be serious. Now, despite the fact that the, the countries understand this, there are some countries that do not have the institutional capacities to distribute benefits on a monthly basis to a large universe of victims territorially dispersed. So, for example, Morocco that ended up doing a very, very good job on reparations on many different dimensions, including the gender dimensions of the program. The Moroccan authorities were convinced that it would be better to distribute the benefits in installments, but they did not have the systems uh, to do that. So in the end, they had to give uh, a one-off payment because this is the only thing uh, that they could do. So that's an example of the fact that there is indeed an institutional capacity uh, dimension to transitional justice uh, uh, questions. But again, I want to make the same point, that just as the sheer economic factors are not the ones that determine the nature of the reparation programs that a country ends up with, the question of institutional capacity is not solely determinant of the shape uh, of uh, the transitional justice program uh, that our country ends up uh, with. And I guess that the diversity of the measures that make up a transitional justice policy helps to explain why that is the case. Because in the domain of transitional justice, there is always a set uh, of initiatives that can be undertaken by governments that have different levels of institutional capacities uh, in different areas that would allow them uh, over time to build up uh, their institutional capacities to be able to do much better than anyone would have expected uh, at first. That is provided that they have the conviction that this is something uh, that is uh, important uh, to do. And on the question of uh, sequencing, part of the idea behind uh, the notion that transitional justice is a comprehensive policy is, I would like to stress, that this is not something that uh, is akin to uh, a menu among uh, that you choose certain items and leave uh, others aside. The idea is that uh, you need uh, to design the different initiatives in relationship to one another which doesn't mean necessarily that all of them have to be implemented in exactly the same way at exactly the same time. But you should, in the design of your comprehensive policy, make sure that at any given point in time, you are taking care of promoting the idea of the realization of the four sets of rights. There is a sense in which the discussion about sequencing also hinges on the fiction that the establishment of these measures is a one-off affair. 
that there is a starting point at which they suddenly spring to life and they start operating. The establishment of each of the transitional justice institutions takes a great deal of groundwork. Their full operation takes many, many skills that countries that have not found the need to cultivate them before the institutions are created usually lack. So these are processes that take a long time the enactment of laws is not the same thing as the zero day for the origins of a transitional justice uh, process. These are protracted processes that have a bit of a history on which they rest and a long history until they fully satisfy their uh, tasks. And therefore, the, the discussion that there is a simple-minded uh, idea of sequencing, first we do truth, uh, then we do reparation. That, for me, doesn't make sense conceptually, but it also doesn't reflect institutional realities. The main point I want to stress is this is a comprehensive policy. They work better when they are seen to be designed as part of a comprehensive whole. Thank you. Let's uh, just time for a couple of other questions. Thank you very much for that conceptual clarity with regard to the meaning of transitional justice. Uh, I just wonder whether you focused on the victim and of course, including the victim and perpetrator is very key. But in post-conflict societies, do not all these pillars have a wider relevance for the whole community that goes beyond, it includes, but goes beyond the victim and the issues of the perpetrator. Each of these pillars eliciting the truth, uh, justice institutions, mechanisms, the process of remedy relief, and the guarantees of non-recurrence are, are all issues which are relevant for the whole of a society which may not include on, which, which, which may not consist only of victims of human rights violations the whole of society isn't there a wider relevance Thank you very much. the whole issue of transitional ja I'm Jehan Pereira uh, the whole issue of transitional justice in our country has arisen in the aftermath of an ethnic conflict we also have a government that is based on democracy. It has to maintain the support of the majority community in order to stay on in power. Now, this is the dilemma in this country that, that the ethnic majority may not necessarily feel that, uh, that those who won the war should be subjected to accountability processes. Have you, in your travels, encountered other countries with similar problems where, where you had to convince the ethnic majority that transitional justice is important and where it has actually succeeded? Because I know that, for instance, countries like Indonesia have had, have had problems and they have set up transitional justice mechanisms, but I don't think they have been so successful maybe there are other parts of the world where there have been ethnic conflicts and where the majority, because that's the problem we face in Sri Lanka, we have to convince the ethnic majority that this is something that is good for everyone, mm -hmm. including, the, including the ethnic majority. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much uh, for the two questions. Uh, just a, a small parenthetical procedural uh, remark. The rule under which the special procedures operate is that they do not comment on their countries uh, until the very last day when they give initial uh, conclusions and recommendations. So I will not refer directly to the situation in uh, Sri Lanka until Monday when I give my uh, press conference before uh, departing. 
So uh, it's not that I do not want uh, to be director. I will have the opportunity to do that, but uh, not tonight with respect to this particular case. However, there are things uh, that can be said. And I thank you very much, Professor, for, the, for your question, because it allows me to emphasize a point uh, that I was trying to make in the, in the talk. When I say that uh, transitional justice has the potential of uh, uh, fostering civic trust, and uh, that it has the potential to contribute to, to processes of social integration, I am not talking just about uh, the effect of the measures on the victims, but the effects of the measures on the victims, but also on society as a whole. Strengthening the rule of law, for example, uh, as uh, an effect is something that benefits not just the victims, but society as a whole. The increase in trust is something that benefits not just victims, but society as a whole. Incidentally, low levels of trust constitute a tremendous developmental drag, one of the most solidly established uh, pieces of evidence in recent social sciences, is that low levels of trust uh, diminish economic activity because they increase transaction costs tremendously. People that do not trust one another engage in economic activity in a defensive way whereas people that trust one another are willing to do all sorts of things that in a low trust environment do not happen. Customize orders, give credit to one another, accept orders at a distance from strangers. In a low trust environment, none of that happens because people are always worried about the defensive, the possibility of default, on, uh, their si on the side of their economic partners. But then the, the general point is, this is something that is important for society as a whole. And it is particularly important when there are cleavages of an ethnic and religious nature to bridge. There are certain types of divisions that are very costly in many different terms for countries to sustain. A low levels of trust, again, are expensive in a different type of uh, sense. Low levels of trust that, for example, leads to constant monitoring. This is extraordinarily expensive for countries to do. But it is expensive not just uh, economically, it is expensive tremendously in human terms. And uh, the argument can be put both positively and negatively. Countries deprive themselves of the active participation of very large parts of, of their population when they operate under conditions of low trust. The benefits that are accrued to countries when they manage to make everyone feel at home in society is extraordinarily liberating in every possible dimension. So I would like to say, yes, this is transitional justice, let me reiterate, is important not as an instrument of turn taking. Transitional justice looks nothing like a witch hunt. It is not a partisan political project. It does not involve purges, attributions of collective responsibility, blaming on a large scale. It involves exactly the opposite. It involves very, very careful, balanced accounts and the efforts to understand uh, a complicated history of violence and rights violations. It involves everyone's efforts in trying to come clean with respect uh, to that past. It involves very, very careful efforts to investigate and attribute uh, responsibility on the assumption, of course, 
that it is not only the rights of victims that need uh, to be defended, but that it is the right of everyone who is investigated and uh, who is uh, uh, brought uh, before a court. So I want to say this is successful only to the extent that it is not seen as a political project to benefit one community over another. And I think that this is, there are plenty of experiences, both negative and positive, that illustrate how the integrative effect of transitional justice is undermined by efforts to turn it into an instrument of politics, to turn it into an instrument to benefit one community over the others. The success of it depends entirely on its capacity to remain faithful to the idea that this is an instrument to strengthen human rights. And that means the rights of all, independently of all other considerations. And that there is no reliable way of doing this, for example, in the domain of criminal justice, except through systems that impeccably obey due process guarantees for everyone. So th th I think that this is uh, very, very important, uh, particularly in the post-conflict uh, contexts, where you have uh, a probably very, very, a very, very large uh, number of cases that need uh, to be addressed, but where in particular it is important to make sure uh, that this is distinguished from anything having to do with uh, the entrenchment of uh, intercommunal conflict. The point is precisely to disarm the intercommunal conflict through means that include recognition and uh, uh, the criminal investigations, but also reparations and also very, very large uh, pro uh, programs of uh, institutional reform. Uh, I think that this is uh, absolutely crucial, that this should be seen as something that is not merely of interest uh, to victims, but and uh, even less to one particular set of victims, but something that is of interest to a system of law that uh, uh, having an effective system of law, uh, which is of course uh, a shared uh, common good, requires something uh, sometimes doing this. So people sometimes ask me, what's your obsession with the past? And I have said, always, I have none. I have an obsession with the present and uh, the future. It's just that sometimes in order to move there, we have to go back uh, and uh, wonder examine how we got to where we are. But the very point of doing this is in many fundamental ways to let the past be past. There is, in fact, uh, in my experience, no alternative to this because these problems do not go away. People do not forget. People do not renounce uh, to their claims. There are countries in which 70 years after the fact, People are still battling for it, and you know what? Succeeding. There is no option to this. Well, thank you very much for uh, the very detailed answer to questions that seemed actually quite yes. related. Yes. Um, uh, uh, the question from uh, Professor Kunaseker about um, uh, benefiting the whole, and the, and the question from Jehan about the potential majoritarian trap in in, in, in democracies and uh, you brought it back to uh, the, the foundations of, of the legal system and the rule of law and perhaps also the separation of powers as, as, as something uh, that could be a normative framework for trying to address the majority tra trap while also the, uh, the transitional justice um, system. Uh, I think that brings us perhaps to the end of this fascinating conversation, um, although I'd very much like to, to continue it. Uh, thank you so, so much for taking this time to, in a very busy schedule, to, to speak uh, to all of us at, the, uh, at, at LKI today. Um, 
uh, your insights have really uh, provided a richer understanding of uh, the mechanisms uh, and the aspects um, that uh, underlie trans transitional justice. Uh, thank you also to the members of the audience who asked questions um, and to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing the program, uh, the Secretariat for coordinating reconciliation mechanisms who valuably partnered in this event. Uh, thanks also to members of uh, LKI's Board of Management uh, for, uh, for their guidance uh, and to uh, the hardworking colleagues of, of LKI for, for helping to organize this event. Thank you very much for attending um, and being with us today. Please do join us on the veranda outside for cake and tea. Thank you very much.